Hello and welcome everyone. We are so happy to have you join us today for an ice cold event this Wednesday. Um, I am Britt Graves, nurse of nine years and community manager here at Trusted. A little bit about Trusted, we are a not your average travel nursing company. Uh, we not only place nurses in the best travel assignments, but we also have a wealth of career resources from events like these and then in-person meetups, uh, blog articles, podcasts, interviews, interviews, and a ton of other amazing things to support you on and off the clock. We are so happy that you're joining us today, and this event will be jam-packed with great information about Arctic Remote Nursing. And before we get started, we just want to thank our partners at the Wilderness Medical Society for providing our stellar hosts and keeping us informed on the latest news and knowledge in the wilderness medical topics. Uh, so I'm going to play this video, and after this short video, we'll get started. We believe the wild keeps us alive. We stand for kindness, service, inclusivity, education, and nature. We elevate others as we climb. We see the need and fill the gap. We look to uproot barriers, not trees. We seek knowledge and pay it forward. We find our way in the wild. We are the Wilderness Medical Society, a community of medical professionals devoted to facilitating high quality care in the outdoors. Our global membership and world renowned experts affirm our collective authority to set clinical standards and disseminate the most comprehensive array of wilderness medicine knowledge. Our innovative programs, publications, research, and certifications equip you with the tools to practice in any environment on or off the planet. Healthy lives are nurtured in wild places. Join us on the adventure and truly come alive. Wow, that got me excited to get out there and adventure. So if you would like any more information or want to check them out, head over to WMS.org. So now let's get into our event while we're all here. Dr. Michelle Devlin is an RN, an EMT, and a doctor of uh, public health. She is also a professor of Arctic and environmental security at the U.S. Army War College. And her primary specialty areas include uh, circumpolar human terrain of the North, environmental migrants, civil military response to climate disasters, indigenous populations, and cross-cultural engagement with diverse and underserved populations. Uh, I'm so ready to get into this. So without further do Dr. Michelle Deplin. I just got my RN license, um, I don't know what, maybe a year ago. I did it at night during our COVID uh, years because we had, uh, we were doing a lot of hybrid and online work in my previous university. And so I added on the RN license, but I've been an EMT, emergency medical technician for probably about 25 years. And I love, you know, being a first responder and, you know, kind of helping out at scenes. So anyway, I've done a lot of medical mission work, do a lot of international and global travel. Uh, and I have to tell you, being in the Arctic as a village health nurse, I was on a research sabbatical up there and worked as a village health nurse for half a year. I've been to many, many countries, traveled all over the world, as I think a lot of you have from what it looks like your backgrounds. Amazingly, I found the Arctic and the American Arctic, the American high north again above the Arctic, Alaska, literally to be probably the most fascinating place I've ever seen on earth and experienced. It is remarkable the way people live, what goes on there, how they deal with extreme situations, the way their environment is changing because of the climate, the way their human populations are changing too because of migration, the need for labor, different people coming in and out. It is absolutely fascinating. I found it transformative. And I think if any of you get a chance to do this type of thing, take a break, go for a year, half a year, maybe a few years, maybe you decide to move there and live there, I think you will find it life-changing. 
it's absolutely amazing. So yeah, and I see some more people uh, writing in. Again, we have a whole bunch of our northern tier states. I've been in Iowa for many years as a professor there at the University of Northern Iowa, so I'm very familiar with uh, Duluth. We go up there a lot, and uh, northern Michigan and Isle Royale and uh, Sarah. Excellent, Jay Bear, Jay Bear, my people. Excellent, my tribe. Good to have you. Good to have you, folks. So with that, could we, Brittany, could we go ahead and um, flip, please? And I'll, I'll go through uh, go through some of that. So what I wanted to uh, kind of fill you in on, again, we've got a lot of folks here that, that have done work, are working in extreme cold environments, extreme remote cold areas. You know, feel, you know, your experience is equally relevant to this topic. Feel free to share either in the chat or, you know, through our conversation this evening, but one of the things I, you know, wanted to start off with is really understanding the U.S. and where we are globally. And I think, you know, when we ask most Americans, well, who do we border, and you know, who 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 are we as Americans? And most Americans obviously know. Well, we board, we have uh, the country of Mexico on our southern border, and then we have the Canadians up north, and we're kind of sandwiched in the middle. But what's amazing, and what many people do not realize, is that the United States also borders Russia. We are an Arctic nation. And if you go all the way up above Canada, you will hit Alaska. Uh, we have we border Russia through the water anyway on the uh, western edge of Alaska. In fact, if you're in the Diomede Islands, and we've got some Alaskan people here, you literally can walk when it's cold enough on the ocean from America to Russia. It's only two and a half miles apart. You can't do it legally, but but you could do it when that uh, the water, the ocean is frozen. It's actually that close. So quite uh, quite interesting. And becoming an Arctic nurse and, and going up, not being subarctic, not being lower than the Arctic Circle, but actually above the Arctic Circle, literally in the North Pole. So the North Pole um, is a geography point. Uh, it, it doesn't exist on land per se. We have the Arctic Ocean. It's surrounded by eight countries, um, depending on how you define it, five to eight countries up on the Arctic Ocean. Uh, but the North Pole is actually in the water. But if you have a chance to go up above the Arctic Circle, that's what I'm kind of talking about for the next few minutes and, and that type of experience. So being in the extreme high north of the world. It is a real career. There are real people there. I think if you do this, you will be bombarded by people asking you all kinds of um, genuinely uh, questions they genuinely want to know the answers to, but filled, frankly, with a lot of stereotypes because people don't know about this region in the world other than Antarctica, it's the other most remote, least dense area of the world. Most people will never be there, will never be anywhere near it. Uh, it's not something made up of fantasies. You can see these kind of romantic, you know, vintage books, you know, the Arctic nurse. And, and you know, I get asked all the time, well, did you work with the Eskimo? Are they living in igloos? You know, do they sit by the seal lamps and, and that type of thing? Well, I did work with the Eskimo. They're called actually the Inupiat, uh, Inupiat tribe. And uh, they don't live in igloos. They actually live in houses, uh, similar to the way most of us live down in the lower... Um, lower 48, except for them being in a 60 below environment in winter, February, March, is just Tuesday. It's just another day. And they function very well. They've been there for 10,000 or more years, depending on what part of the Arctic you're looking at. They are brilliantly adapted. It's very comfortable the way they live. They know how to survive in that type of remote area. So we have much to learn from them. I I remain in deep honor and deep gratitude to everything that they taught me. This is a very humbling experience if you get a chance to do it, and literally one that can not just help them and those patients, but help help you and really become very transformative. Next. So if you take a look on this map again, just to kind of give you the big picture overview of where we're talking about I think that all of you that wrote in are all writing in from the United States, uh, not Canada or other countries. So you can see the U.S. in blue on the lower right there. And then you see the beige, that's Canada above the U.S. But then take a look at that blue, that aqua, whatever, green, blue color. That's the state of Alaska. 
it is absolutely massive. It's about a th roughly a third of the United States. It's huge. It has many unique areas to it. And then take a look to the left of Alaska. You've got the country of Russia. Russia is massive. In fact, Russia makes up roughly half of the North Pole, half of the circumpolar world. It's that big. It has roughly half the population and half the land mass and is really huge. But if you take a look at Alaska, it's actually a maritime state. It's an ocean state. It's got the largest coastline in the country of the US and it has more coastline than all of the United States, the lower 48 combined. Um, and you can see right there, look at where the border, see the border in water between Russia and the US and how close that is. Uh, you can actually see Russia from your house, but not from the Matsu Valley, not from Anchorage. Uh, you'd have to be way, way, way west on some of those uh, islands like the Diomedes uh, to actually see Russia, but we do border. We do border them technically. So if you look at Alaska, look way up top, you see something called the Chukchi Sea, and then to the right of it, the Beaufort Sea. That's where I was, and there is a point on top of that, the farthest point, is actually the little town. It's the biggest city uh, city on the north slope of Alaska. It's actually about 5,000 people. It's called Barrow or Utkiagvik, uh, Alaska Barrow, what's typically known as Barrow, Alaska. It's the largest of the communities. The north slope of Alaska has roughly 11,000 people, 5,000 of them live in Barrow. And then the rest of the communities up in the most, most of those communities on the north slope are native indigenous villages with uh, Inupiat and other tribal members living in them overwhelmingly. So the north slope of Alaska, North Arctic Alaska is heavily indigenous. If you're going there to work, you are working with the Indian Health Service or the Alaskan Tribal Service and these other entities that I'll talk about. But anyway, that's where I was. And what's really cool, again, that is the Northwest Passage, the fabled Northwest Passage you might have heard about in school, high school, you know, and uh, how, uh, you know, Europeans were looking for a way west and, and going through, you know, these ice fields and frozen fields because of climate change, a lot of that is melting. It's very sad. You can now at times of the year make your way west through the Northwest Passage. But anyway, a lot of the indigenous villages are right along the Arctic Ocean. So it's the North Pacific. Next, please. So uh, Alaska, and again, we've got we've got some of my J Bear, uh, Sarah our J Bear uh, uh, tribe members here with me, and uh, and forgive me, I forget we had our our woman from Haines, and I'm, there might be some other Alaskans here too, and Alaska-based people. But um, it, it's a remarkable state, as you know, it is huge. Again, it makes up about a third of America. You could take Alaska, you could cut it in half, and Texas would still be ranked only third in terms of being the biggest of the state. So it is massive. It's incredibly diverse from a geography standpoint. I think it's stunningly beautiful, remarkably breathtakingly beautiful. There are times when I would go hiking or you know whatever would be out and about, whether it be on the Northern Arctic tundra or down in Anchorage or in the mountains or down by Juneau or the, wherever you may be, it, it is remarkable. Different parts of the state are different from others between flat tundra to high mountains to glaciers to forests. Um, absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's unique also because nobody lives there. It's the least populated state in the country, only about one person per square mile. So if you are interested in remote area medicine, this is your kingdom. This is your empire. And then if you go even to more remote areas, like up on the North Slope of Alaska, Northwest Borough, those areas, and you're working some of the native villages, indigenous places around the state, you're in even more remote territory. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, in the U.S., we have rough, I'm over generalizing, but we're roughly approaching 500 or so tribes, 450, 500 or so tribes. Alaska has roughly half of the native tribes are in Alaska. It's that diverse. In fact, one in five Alaskans is actually of indigenous 
descent. So again, if you and you are someone that likes to work with very diverse populations, you love thriving on cross-cultural nursing, uh, transcultural health issues, you know, where you're working across cultures, again, this is your kind of place. You would probably end up, uh, depending on where you were employed, you could be working with the federal or through an organization funded by the Federal Indian Health Service uh, or one of the tribal health services. When I was up on the North Slope, I worked with ASNA, the Arctic Slope Native Association. It's the Inupiats, right? The Northern and the Polar Eskimo, their uh, tribal health programs up there. You've got tribal corporations. Their, uh, Alaska has a world, literally a world famous program called the CHAPS program, Community uh, Health Aid Program, literally world class in remote areas, in, in uh, native communities, uh, doing primary care, staffed heavily by indigenous uh, people that have been trained for two years. They're not nursing degrees, they're community health aides, but it, uh, fascinating. And then if, you know, if you're too sick to be seen by them, then you are maybe potentially flown out or you're, you're referred on basically. In our case in Anchorage, uh, you well, North Slope, you referred down to Anchorage, uh, but, but quite interesting. And when we talk about Arctic nursing in the American high north, you can be an Arctic nurse, of course, in northern Canada, northern Scandinavia. Um, I would not go to Russia now, of course, being at war, but, uh, you know, Greenland, that type of thing. But in the U.S. high north, you're ba if you look at that map, you see they don't have counties. They really function as boroughs in Alaska. So I was based in the North Slope borough. They say you're either on slope or off slope. Uh, Northwest Arctic Borough uh, is is in, up there in blue. And then Nome, I forget, I thought we had somebody in Nome or that had been in Nome listening, but you can see kind of that pinkish area on the left. So those would be, and then bits of in yellow, that would be basically above the Arctic Circle uh, in that area. So that's what we're talking about. Next, please. So uh, it's very interesting. I think a lot of you, if you're involved in wilderness medicine, a lot of you are probably involved in environmental issues, climate change. It, it's really quite sad. What we're seeing is that the Arctic, the North Pole and the South Pole, Antarctica, they are warming about four to seven times faster than anywhere else on Earth because a lot of that whiteness of the snow and the ice that used to reflect sunlight out it's melting, and the more it's melting, the darker it is, the more it absorbs sunlight, and the more things melt. So it's an exponential melting. It's very, very sad. You will see it everywhere. You can talk to the local people. They've been tracking this for decades. This is not something that's happening today, nor is it something that uh, it'll be here in five or ten years. It's been here for decades. This has been going on, uh, and it's getting worse and worse. So we're seeing melting sea ice, retreating ice packs, permafrost land is melting the ice in that. Uh, there are buildings that are collapsing that are sitting on that. I worked in those houses and places. Um, more and more violent storms. The Alaskans on here, I'm sure, could talk forever about the uh, heavier wind storms, the erosion of the coastlines, uh, hurricanes that we didn't used to get up in the North Pacific. We get now uh, communities like Kivalina and Northwest uh, Arctic Borough having to be pushed uh, manage retreat and physically relocated because they are eroding and the ocean is rising and the storms and the winds are too heavy. But because of that, the, we are seeing um, an increase in the need for health professionals, nurses, and others to do work uh, up in the Arctic. And I would suspect no uh, no random chance that Sarah from J Bear with the Army is listening in as well. The Army and the military is all over these issues because it falls under the category of environmental security. So it's quite, uh, quite disturbing, but quite fascinating. Next, please. So uh, types of nurses needed in the U.S. Arctic. I am. This is in Alaska. So northern Alaska. Okay, pretty much most of Alaska is de designated as a health provider shortage area or a medically underserved area. It gets even more extreme the farther north you go. Uh, in the Arctic, there are not too many people that want to deal with that level of remoteness, challenges, cold, 
uh, isolation, things like that. So it's a challenge to get health providers of any background up there. And if you get them, they often don't stay. But I pretty much guarantee you that every single one of you, no matter what your background is, they need you there. They'd love to have you. The picture is Samuel Simmons Hospital. I was based out of there in Barrow, but then I was part of the village health unit for six months. And so um, I had the privilege of being able to fly in the little commuter planes and bush planes and all out to the remote villages on the tundra. Uh, and so it's kind of the best of both worlds. And then we were doing telemedicine in the hospital, except technology was so uh, bad. We, weren't, we didn't even have visuals. We were doing it by writing each other in the village centers and the hospital is just crazy. But anyway, pretty much any specialty is much needed there. Emergency, primary care, women's health, uh, public health nursing is really big when you're dealing in remote areas. You typically will not focus a lot on high specialty levels. You're doing you know, a lot of the basic care and then people that need specialty care are gonna get sent out by airplane or they will, they will fly. You can't drive to the Arctic. Uh, 85% of Alaska is bush Alaska. Uh, it's either no roads or gravel roads. You can't drive to most of Alaska. You have to fly in bush planes. Or if you're close enough in the villages, you might be able to use snow machines or dog sled, that kind of thing, ATVs. But generally, you're flying to get around. Uh, substance abuse, mental health. Those of you that do mental health, they would love to have you up there. Pediatrics, case management, uh, and again, it's fascinating. It's almost like its own national healthcare system in the remote areas and in the Arctic, you'll do a lot of primary, secondary level care, and then anything tertiary or real high level specialty, again, you're gonna get referred out. And there are, so we do medevac, we were running medevacs for the hospital as well from the villages, sending medevac um, flights from the borough and, and um, you know, out to the villages, picking up people, maybe bringing them into our hospital, stabilizing them, and then sending them off to Anchorage in other planes. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Next, please. The, uh, a number of different places that you can consider working. And I, at the end, I do have some links for you where you can go on and actually look into specific job opportunities. But really, again, any type of medical background is going to be in need. So uh, it, it just depends if you have a level that they're going to provide you with housing and benefits or if you're kind of on your own. So people that may be CNAs or EMTs, they definitely will hire you as techs in a lot of the facilities, but it's, it's expected that you're a local person. They're not going to be providing you with hospital housing or clinic housing and that type of thing. But if you are really an RN on up, so the RNs and BSNs uh, and definitely the nurse practitioners, you're going to be in great demand. You could end up working in uh, hospitals. There are almost none of them in the Arctic, in the American Arctic. There are really just two. One of them is Samuel Simmons in Barrow that I showed you. That's a big one. And then the other main one is the um, Manilak um, Health Center in Kotz, in Kotzebue, in the Northwest Arctic Borough. And that's, and no, I mean, no, I mean, that's really pretty much it. You're not going to be able to do a lot of hospital nursing unless you're located in those places. Uh, village health, the villages are all part, are linked up with the Alaska Community Health Aid Program. The villages, most of them in Indian Native, they have basically urgy centers. They have Alaska Community Health Aid Center, health centers that are very nice. They run like urgy centers. You've got, again, people that staff there do primary care and then you get referred out if you're more critically ill. Uh, there is 24 seven access there. there uh, the town, the villages all have volunteer first responders. In Iowa, I was a volunteer, you know, rural ambulance first responder kind of person. They do the same thing in Alaska and in Northern Alaska. They're just up there, they're indigenous. Uh, but they volunteer, they'll, you know, 911 calls and they'll go to the house, grab somebody, take them to the urgy care in the village, stabilize them, and then probably get them airlifted in a barrow or anchorage, depending on how sick they are. Uh, there are, you could, if you do public health and that type of thing, they'd love to have you in the borough health departments. So the county health departments, North Slope Borough, Northwest Arctic Borough, Nome area, those uh, types of borough health departments, they definitely hire nurses. 
uh, indigenous facilities, the tribes have money. They, uh, they're, remember, this is a part of the country, part of Alaska with the oil and gas money. This is where the Alaska uh, National Pipeline is, ConocoPhillips, all the oil companies, Prudhoe Bay, Dead Horse, all those famous names that you've heard. Um, so a lot of the tribes operate their own facilities. They may run their own nursing homes or other type of nonprofits. And depending on what they're doing, they may hire their own nursing care. Of course, travel nursing is massive up in the Arctic because it's hard to get people that want to live there or be there or go back and forth. Travel nurses are extremely common. During COVID, I was there during COVID. I was uh, I was a regular nurse, not a travel nurse. So I was surrounded by travel nurses. They were being paid an amazing amount of money. They literally were getting about $100 an hour uh, so roughly 200,000 a year to work as a COVID travel nurse up in the Arctic. But some of these people had two years of experience. You know, they were, it, it was amazing the salaries they were getting. So travel nurses are really important. And our Alaskans here on the, on the call, you recognize this picture, these kinds of photographs. I'm sure you've seen them before. That is the ice road, uh, kind of connects, it's roughly outside of Nuuksut, uh, Dead Horse, that area. But there are actually a number of ice roads up in the high north. And of course, you can't be on them in July because it's too warm. And in fact, with climate change, it's shrinking the amount of time you can actually drive on them. And they're very dangerous. You have to go in convoys so you don't you know, sink or get stranded. There are no bathrooms there along the way, no food. But that is... Um, how people sometimes can get from places like Anchorage to Denali to Fairbanks up to the North Slope certain times of the year. And then the rest of the time they can't, they have to fly in. Next, please. So the types of health issues that you're going to deal with, um, I, I love it. Again, I do global health. So it is cross-cultural health. If you are someone that does not want to work with people that are different from you, that are diverse, that have different health beliefs and practices, um, that may do traditional medicine, you know, within their culture, that have traditional belief practices, uh, that operate very differently, then really this is not a great site. This is the kind of health care you do. It's equivalent to what you would do if you were in the Peace Corps or USAID or the UN, or you know, you're on a medical mission somewhere in a very remote area of the world. It's the same kind of stuff, okay, except these are Americans. Um, so you will see a mix of general uh, chronic, you know, the typical chronic diseases. And of course, you can probably guess of all those chronic diseases, which one is most common? Diabetes, right? Because you've got indigenous populations who actually used to have excellent fitness levels and excellent uh, consumption of the local foods. They were the original keto diet people, right? They lived off of marine mammals and that's where they got their vitamins, by the way. The marine mammals actually produce uh, a lot of the vitamins that today we take vitamins for. But uh, as communities get richer, you tend to see the imports of junk food and simple carbohydrates coming in. So the native villages have little tiny, tiny stores in them. They are usually half empty. It's always hard to get supplies up there. And if they have anything, they tend to be junk food. So you will have a heavy consumption of energy drinks, chips, and just a lot of stuff like that, which, you know, jacks up, you know, you know there's some blood sugar and diabetes and overweight and obesity. So you will see that a lot, uh, unfortunately. Um, some heart, some cancer, mostly diabetes. Uh, maternal and child health will dominate. These are large families. If you like kids, peds, you want to do pediatric nursing, it's awesome. A lot of kids, a lot of babies, you know, four or five, six children per family, very common. Uh, mental health will be an issue you can definitely run in, definitely can be dealing with uh, substance use, uh, alcohol, uh, marijuana, you know, illicit, uh, illicit drugs, and then depression and things, and that mixing together, the loss of culture, cultural genocide, as you will hear that phrase used sometimes among, uh, by the Native people about what has happened to them and the loss of their traditional lifestyles and culture is very uh, traumatic. 
uh, malnutrition in the sense, again, of over nutrition and junk food and the overconsumption of simple carbohydrates. Uh, infectious diseases can be an issue. COVID, COVID definitely was, but the local uh, villagers took charge of that very quickly to protect their elders and access to those villages. So that was good. By far, my favorite things to deal with were ones unique to the environment. So uh, cold injuries, definitely hypothermia, exposure, people out on the tundra, you know, you have to bring them in and there were amputations, uh, hunting injuries for real polar bear hunting injuries, seal hunting injuries, caribou, you know, hunting the caribou on snow machines and you hit a bump and flipped out and that kind of stuff. Um, unintentional, unintentional injuries, very serious issues with domestic violence, gender violence issues, suicide, murder, and things like that. That, that makes up very typical issues you'll see. They are primarily indigenous uh, families, Inupiat heavily, other native groups, and climate change migrants. The labor force up in the Arctic is made up of Filipinos, Hawaiians, Samoans, Tongans, Thais, Laos, Cambodians, other, other immigrants coming from the Pacific because their countries are going underwater, frankly, with climate change, literally, or their economies are decimated with too many climate disasters. And the Arctic has very high salaries and they are all people of the sea. Remember the Eskimo, the Inupiat are marine, are polar indigenous people. They are people of the sea. So despite differences in extreme cold and equatorial heat, there is an affinity culturally of people of the sea. Next, please. Uh, challenges, uh, you know, Basically, if you look at this list and this makes you more excited and you want to do it, you are my kind of people. And I bet this is exactly who you, who you are. Um, it's extreme remote. You want to do remote area medicine. This is where you go because nobody's there and you can't come and go very easily. It's pretty isolated. You got to fly in, got to fly out. It can be difficult to get housing if you don't have the job providing you with apartments or housing and having room for maybe your wife, your husband, your kids, whatever, you, you've got to, you got to be aware of that. That is going to be a big issue. Uh, it's hard to build up there and expensive. Remember you have the light issues. You're on the North pole. So you have roughly two months, 67 days of darkness. Although you have twilight, it's not totally dark, but you've got darkness. It's dark there right now. The sun went down around Thanksgiving. It's not going to rise again until mid January. Uh, that can be an issue for people with depression and, you know, sad seasonal affective stuff. So a lot of people have the little lights to keep them going. Same thing in the summer, except it's the opposite. I love it. You have like two solid months of pure daylight. And it's great. If you're an outdoor enthusiast, you can go play all day. And that's what most people do. It is expensive. If you expect your relatives to come see you or a lot, they probably won't. Or they think you're an anchorage. You know, they'll go to Jay Bear, Sarah, to come see you, but they're not going to fly up to Barrow, the extra amount of time and money to come come see you there. Uh, and it's hard to do exercise. You know, it is extreme cold. You can have February, March at 60 below, wind chill, 40, 50, 60 below. Not so fun to go out and start jogging in. You're gonna, that's, that's what you're going to have to give up. But there are gyms that you can go to, so that's fine. Uh, and the gear, like this. Um, this is actually one of my favorite coats. One of my Inupiat women friends made this for me. You have to have specialized clothing. If you're just going to stay in your apartment, walk across the parking lot, go to the hospital or clinic, and then go live in your apartment again, you can get by with gear, what you have. Those of you that are the Minnesotans, the Michiganders, Vermonters, those kinds of, you know, you'll be okay with that kind of clothing. But if you actually want to go outside more than that, you will need to spend uh, a good Arctic level coat is about $1,500. You'll need Arctic level uh, pants, the, the head, all of the clothing, the face, gloves, all, all of it literally is typically thousands. You probably need about four to 5,000 on gear if you're an outdoor person in the Arctic. If you're not, you can save a lot of that money and stick with regular cold weather gear in the lower 48. Next, please. And by the way, that's that picture there was one of the little uh, 
planes. That's what it was like that we would take out to the villages and you land on ice, you fly over the tundra. It's, it, it would bring tears to my eyes. It was so stunningly beautiful and amazing. You'd fly over the caribou. Sometimes you couldn't land because the caribou were on the ice strip or the gravel strip, but then you land, there may be 10 of you, usually not. They're like four of, you, four of you in the airplane and half the plane, they take the seats out and we'll put in the energy drinks and the junk food for the villages. And that's how they get their uh, in and out of the food supply to these remote areas. But then the villagers will show up and, and with their trucks and load off things. But with all that said, it is remarkable. I do hope that you you find a way to do this, even if it's for a relatively short time. I think you will find it transformative. It is an absolute honor to live with and work with and learn from these indigenous families. Many of them, you know, they're depending on what part of the Arctic we're talking about, those, those populations, some of them have been there 10,000 years or more, okay? They, they know this part of the world. No one else lives there. It is a spiritual home to them. And if you're interested in learning, they will teach you why it's such a special place. You are also able to see firsthand, it's not good, but you will see it, what climate change looks like, because this is a part of the world where it's happening most severely. It's been going on for decades. You can really see it happening. I am very sad to report that yesterday, I think yesterday, the day before, it was 40 degrees in Barrow, Alaska. That should not ever happen. It should be solidly under ice and probably right around zero at this time of the year. That is not good. That's bad for the caribou. It's bad for the whales. It's bad for the polar bears. It's bad for the humans. And it affects the rest of the world. It changes the ocean currents, the wind patterns, the jet stream, and it's not good. But if you want to see it, this is the time to see it. Bring your children. Uh, you know, this is an area where you go to really test yourself, to push yourself you will not find too many other people the rest of your life that will say, yeah, I was, you know, up there, up in the Arctic. I was up in the North Pole or the South Pole, right? Antarctica. You can take this a step further and get into nursing in Antarctica. Uh, people don't really live there, but there are scientists at work in McMurdo Station and other places. They hire for nurses all the time, especially high-level nurses. So Keep your eyes out for that. But if you are an outdoor enthusiast, Alaska and Arctic Alaska is your place. You, I, I'm an avid musher. I've actually been dog sledding for 10 years now all over lots of different parts of the U.S. and around the world. But there is nothing like mushing in the Arctic and traditional sledges and you run 10 dogs. And we were out there dog sledding on the frozen Arctic Ocean. It is it's, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Uh, if you're a snowmobile, snow machine person, so much fun. That's how they get around. You don't really go in cars, you go in snow machines. Bush planes, if you're gonna work up there, you do have to be okay with being in a little tiny airplane because there are no big jets in between a lot of these villages. They're all little, little planes. Any of the outdoor adventure sports, you would love it up there. Uh, unparalleled opportunities to see polar animals that are remarkable and they are dying and they are going extinct. It is horrible. But polar bears, you're in Barrow, you're going to see polar bears out on the uh, peninsula. Caribou, they'll be in your backyard, they'll be in your parking lot. Reindeer, okay, reindeer are caribou, Arctic fox, all of those. If you get in good with the indigenous, spend your free time with them, becoming part of their families, listening and learning and honoring their knowledge. You will be invited to help uh, process and eat the whale. Bowhead whale is what they live on. These are hunters. You must be okay with that. Even if you don't hunt, you will be surrounded by people that still rely on hunting in order to survive. Otherwise, they'll die in the Arctic. You do not have good food supplies. It's a food desert in terms of you know, processed food, not, not animals, but um, you will help process those animals. Muck tuck is whale. You'll probably end up eating seal. Uh, I, I can't even tell you the amount of an animals. And if you're with the Inupia, you will need to eat that as a way to honor them. You can't make faces about that, but it's, it's, it's actually okay. It's okay. And they are very uh, sacred in what they do with hunting. It's not hunting to put up trophies on a wall. This is survival for food. The entire community eats, the entire community participates and benefits. There's no individual ownership 
of uh, food or any of this thing. You can take classes at the local tribal college from the elder women. I, I did that. I love that. They'll teach you how to skin sew. You can make things like this. Uh, they taught me how to make the gloves, how to make parkas. Uh, absolutely fascinating to learn with these elder women. You can learn their language, Inupiaq language. Uh, these jobs typically have very high salaries because most people don't want to be that remote or that cold. They usually have excellent benefits, and you're really going to be working in an underserved part of the world that really needs, uh, really needs the help. Next, please. So I'll finish with just a few photographs. Um, you know, so I'm from LA. We're ocean people. These are Pacific people. Um, and then I lived in the Midwest and I've, you know, looked at lakes in the winter and what they look like. This is the Arctic Ocean. This is what it looks like in February. It's completely frozen. Actually, used, used to be frozen year round. Now with climate change, it is melting more and that ice pack is receding. Used to go out 20 miles and I was there, it would only extend about four miles at uh, the time I was on it. But uh, it's amazing. It's like you're walking through shards of glass and, and the pressure ridges can be 20, 30, 40, 50 feet high. It's really impossible to walk across it. The Inupiat will take their snow machines or their dog sleds out there. They'll cut a trail through all those shards of ice. They go out to the way edge and then they put out their umiaks or like these group kayaks. And that's how they hunt, do traditional hunting crews of five or six of them in the umiak, catching the bow, the sacred bowhead whales. They do not waste those animals. They are limited, usually can just catch one per crew. And again, that food is shared with, uh, with uh, everyone. So very, very common scene. One of the most remarkable is the Arctic Ocean. Next, please. Uh, for those of you, uh, Sarah and I, I forget who other, somebody else in Haines and other parts of Alaska, you're probably more used to seeing the mountains of Alaska. There are many different uh, mountain ranges. Of course, Denali is the tallest mountain. North America, it's in Alaska, north of Anchorage. You can go see Denali. This one is actually uh, near Anchorage um, by Alyeska. Uh, if you've been to that resort or that spa area, it's beautiful. But you can do glacier walking. You can do glacier hiking. And, and here you are. You're very, very close to Anchorage. Uh, and yet you're almost, you're basically in utter wilderness. You don't have to go very far until you hit pure wilderness. So lots of fun stuff to learn and explore and do. Next, please. Uh, this is a very typical scene. If you wonder what the native villages look like up on the North Shore of Alaska, this is it uh, during May. Well, you see the one down, the, the home below there, and then all that red stuff in front of it. This is typically what you would see in May um, during the spring whale hunt. The month of May, they will do the whale hunting. They'll bring the whale back, and then we'll you know cut it up chunks of it for everybody in the community to take. They'll do community potlucks and boils and bakes and, you know, things like that. But that's a very common scene. Uh, and the one up top there again of the little, uh, those are all gravel roads. You don't really have anything paved. Um, and yeah, 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 people, uh, uh, yeah, people ask, are they living in igloos? No, they're not living in igloos. They're, they're surviving. They're not just surviving, they're thriving up in the north, uh, they do Facebook a lot. They go to church on Sundays or girls play ba midnight basketball in the high school. Uh, they play mean bingo. Do not mess with them with bingo. They're going to take you down, uh, go to the whaling commission, bingo halls and the community centers. They'll invite you there and go play bingo with them. Uh, you know, they, they have very rich lives and it's centered around family and their tradition. They do great festivals. You should go to all their festivals, join in their dancing, join in their eating, make food with them, share, laugh and love. And that's, that's very much how they, how they function up there. Next, please. Uh, that again in my, uh, the woman, Susan Hope, that made this uh, for me. She is one of the faculty members at Ilisagvik College, learning from indigenous women because they are the makers of the skin 
protective clothing that has kept people alive for thousands of years. In fact, Sarah, I've been doing a lot of work with the Army on lessons learned from indigenous women on survival in the Arctic and with uh, special forces and stuff. So we certainly talk after, but these are the kind of elder women that know this stuff to a very, very high level. Next, please. Polar bears, these uh, photos are actually taken from one of my uh, net, uh, nurse practitioners friends up there. And these were right out, they were in Koktovik. If you get a chance to go to the village of Koktovik near the Canadian border and the Alaska Wildlife, National Wildlife Refuge, um, they're there. And they're there because it's melting. They can't go out onto the ice very much anymore to catch seals. So the locals feed them. They give them all of the leftover whale bones in the whale bone pile. And that's where the bears come. You see 30, 40, 50, 70 polar bears together eating bones. That is not normal. They are incredibly independent. That is what climate change looks like and the impact on the wildlife. Next, please. Northern Lights, um, yeah, I, you know, it just, it still brings tears to my eyes. The local indigenous will tell you that those are the spirits of the ancestors. And when you go out at three in the morning and you use your app on your phone that tells you when the Northern Lights are out above where you are, and you go out at three in the morning in the pitch dark and it's 40 below, and it is the most sacred thing you will have ever seen in your life. And your ancestors and all your past relatives are dancing and they come down to touch you as you lift your hands above you and the, the local people are right about that. It is remarkable. Next, please. And I think the last picture I wanted to show you, this is the local uh, fire volunteer fire station, Browerville, one of them in Barrow, Alaska, Kiagvik. It's currently staffed, when I left a few months ago, it was staffed 100% by Samoans climate change migrants and others, again, that are now working up north. So very, very diverse populations to work with. Great fun. Everybody shares everything together. It's a real community. And again, I, I would encourage all of you to, to get a chance. If you can't work up there as a nurse, at least go travel. If you're going to go to Alaska, take a few extra days out beyond Anchorage. Fly up to Barrow. It's another hour, 20 minutes or so from the Anchorage airport get a hotel, top of the world or whatever. There are not a lot of places to stay there and spend a few days wandering around and see the Arctic before it goes away because it is changing very, very dramatically. So that's what I had for you, uh, pictures. And um, uh, I think we have time for some questions here. And I think Brittany, uh, Brittany will put up my contact information at the very end. This particular slide, again, if you're interested in doing this for work, if you Google, these locations and look into them. They all have job opportunities and employment opportunities and, you know, keep your eyes out. It, uh, it takes a while to get hired. If you're looking to be up there next Monday, it's probably not going to happen. It may be three, four, five months down the road. Remember, these are consensus based cultures. A lot of, a lot of different people weigh in. Uh, but again, if you think maybe half a year from now, you might want to do this, I would apply already to some of these different places. So that that is there um, for you if you want to look into more of these opportunities. So what comment, comments, questions, anything do you have? And again, I know some of you are, I, you know, and some of you may never get up to Northern Alaska. You can have similar experiences. Um, yeah, Zach, yeah, I'm looking at your question here. Um, you can, uh, <laughs> You can work in the extreme cold in northern Minnesota and Duluth, let me assure you, northern Michigan and the UP, Vermont. These are places that were often short practitioners. They can all use your help. And Zach, it's a great question. You don't necessarily have to go all the way up beyond the Arctic Circle. Um, actually, if you want to work specifically in the Brooks Range, like uh Anaktuvik Pass and that they are going to be affiliated with the Northwest Borough. It's counterintuitive, but Manilak Health Center, and that's on there, that other slide. I would check in with them. They're the ones that hire, I believe, for the Anaktuvik Pass Village Health Center. But again, even if you don't want to be that far north, anywhere in Alaska um, is short of staff, short of nurses. You could have a great 
indigenous health experience working anywhere in Alaska, even down south where it's warmer, uh, where you don't have to deal with the remoteness, you can drive and that kind of stuff. So this is if you want to do true Arctic Circle stuff, but you can, you know, if you're intrigued by Alaska and remote area health, lots of fun places to work there. Uh, and if you literally, if you Google nursing jobs in Alaska, you'll come up with many. They tip, now not always, but typically you may be able to work six months up there because it's a shortage area on your home license, but then you would have to get it converted. That's what we had to do up on the North Slope. All right. Well, we have some more questions coming in and thank you guys so much, man. That honestly, I don't say this a lot, but that was amazing. I'm here for all of this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I wish we could do like a whole um, medical, you know, if we ever get a chance, I'm just take you guys there. It is so cool. It is. It's fascinating. We're ready. We're ready. You can, well, I'll, I'll be on that trip. <laughs> Let me tell you. Um, Carol uh, is just singing her praises to you. Just great info. Um, and now she wants to go. So that's just, yeah, that's a positive you. there. Um, Lisa no, is saying, yeah. <laughs> while the wages are high, so are Living. 30 years ago, when we looked into moving to Alaska, we found that the high pay did not make up for the cost of living. Is that true in this situation? Uh, yeah, that's a great, great point. Definitely one of the pluses and minuses you're going to want to take a look at. Now, when I was in Barrow and because of the program I was on with the hospital, they paid, I would have done it for free. Like I would have paid them to let me go be there like in the Peace Corps, but whatever, they, they paid me well, but they also covered a lot of things. So our housing was heavily subsidized. Parts of our, if you're a provider, a nurse practitioner up there, your meals are paid for. So I, I would shop around. Uh, there, it, there's a lot of diversity in the employers, and I would compare who's going to provide what level of supplemental funding and benefits. And then some areas are more expensive than others. The Arctic and Barrow definitely are definitely among the most expensive in Alaska. Um, and you, you know, and again, if you're like a CNA or an EMT. You're, you're probably not going to be able to be up there unless you've got family and you're living, you know, with people. Okay, perfect. Uh, Samantha asks, any particular challenges or tips for um, a Alaska licensure? It, um, it takes a long time. So if you're going to come in and work in a shortage area, and again, if they're going to let you work on your home license, Maybe they give you six months again, like they did with us up in Barrow. I would start applying for the Alaska license the next week you know, that you start because it can take a number of a number of months. So that was the biggest issue. And again, if you're working in some of these remote locations, just being able to get to a post office, uh, weather controls everything. There were, you know, if you're going to work in the Arctic, especially you're a village health nurse, maybe you're stuck in a village, you can't get back to Barrow for three days because they had a blizzard and all the little bush planes have been canceled out. You know, so it's more logistical, uh, logistical issue. I see Sherry said, what, less than two months and got it. Yay, good, good. Wish that had happened up where, <laughs> where it was, but yeah. Perfect. And also just to plug uh, Trusted, we actually do have a licensure guide. So if you're a little confused or you need to know, you know, uh, the specifics or, or what they require, we do have a licensure guide. So Alaska will be up there and you can kind of look and all the resources and things will be up there as well. But it looks like Sherry also has some good information. So if you want to <laughs> hit her up, that might be a cool. good uh, idea. Super. But um uh, we have another question. I'm still a student. Do you have suggestions or recommendations for specific experience prior to doing such rural care? That is such a good question. So if you were to do this, you would be like me because I, again, my, I'm a public health person. I only got into nursing. Like a lot of you, I just got into nursing recently. So when I went up there, that meant that I started, well, I was doing village health. We were doing telehealth. So I was a case manager, telehealth village nurse. And then when I went physically to the villages, you know, I'd be with a nurse practitioner and they were, you know, I'd have to, they would have to show me a lot of that clinical stuff. You know what it's like when you're a baby nurse and you just graduate. So the, 
if you're a brand new nurse, it will be challenging to be in an extreme remote environment because you're going to need somebody to supervise you. If you're like me, you don't want me, you know, going, giving, doing IVs on a patient without anybody seeing me when I graduated a month ago from school that, you know, it's that kind of issue. So make sure you're going to have adequate supervision and mentors with you. But other than that, they would love to have you, you know, public health nursing would be a good fit. Uh, again, tele, telehealth nursing is a good fit to start and you'll get worked into everything because they're short as usual, like everywhere you're going to get, you know, roped into other potential gigs. Did you experience hey, Ellie, problems in t obtaining? Oh, you can, you can answer that if you would like to. That's okay. I just happened to catch Ellie's comment, like PQ nurse, wilderness medicine, EMT, and a paramedic. Like, wow. <laughs> then you've got HR offices that don't know what they're looking at. If they don't know what to do with somebody like you with your background, I would look elsewhere. You've got an, you've got enough variety. None of these organizations dominate. You have so many different tribal health places, federal, count, you know, borough, county, private. If you if you're applying to some of these HR offices and they don't know how to interpret your background and how you could be of use to them, apply to one down the road. That's what I would say. My goodness, you've got a perfect background for this, Ellie. Perfect background. Yes, and uh, Kelly, you're right. Fellowship with the Academy of Wilderness Medicine, absolutely. And Britt, I think. You and said Ellie, I can question. also I speak to that. that. Um, yeah, I can get to that one. Ellie, I just want to speak to you as well. Um, I am all the things. Like I'm a picky nurse. I've done medical missions, all the things. So I completely understand. Um, some of the things that I did is actually spelling it out for them that you can care from. Uh, neonates up to 18, and then also kind of talking about the pop patient population that you do serve. Um, you can attribute it to some of the similar ones that Michelle actually spoke to. You do diabetes, like things like that. Um, a lot of times, if you look up the keywords to what they're looking for or the things or the, or the populations that they serve, you can kind of speak to that as well. Um, and then if you have done any the EMT work and the paramedic work that you've done, you can also speak to that in a little bit more breadth. Um, I know that resume writing and things like that and interviewing is a little difficult sometimes, but there are also a lot of resources out there as well um, that can help you with interviewing, putting the keywords together on your resume to, to get past those things. Um, and always, I'm here. If you need anything, you can reach out to us here as well. Um, I just always want to make sure I take care of my picky people. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, but Brittany, yes, uh, keep yeah. going. <laughs> Yeah, I agree completely with what uh, Brittany was saying. It's a really good point. And it reminded me that so often, again, you're in remote areas, everybody is understaffed, including the human resources department, including the groups that hire. They may have a handful of people, one, people working there or no one working there and they go out on maternity leave. I literally had that happen. Somebody left for four months and that was it. You know, and then they contacted me eight months after I applied and by then it was too late. You know, it, um, and, and they, they, they typically are not people trained in health. So Brittany, yeah, she brought up a very good point. Make sure that your application matches word for word what they're looking for, because you literally could be reviewed by an 18 year old, you know, local resident, they're short on staff and they don't know, they, they don't know. I did see that happen a tremendous number of times. Perfect. Um, Carol asks, did you experience problems obtaining medical supplies? Yes. Um, yes, we did. And that was partly because it was COVID. I was there in the height of COVID, so that was a nightmare anyway. And then, yes, because being up in the Arctic, we are generally very low on supplies. Um, things would have to be mailed in. The village health units would often be short. One of my jobs was to mail them supplies from Barrow if we had them and we didn't. But yes, that's, and even just basic stuff, toothbrushes, things to do a public health, a public health nursing talk on, they can use any of that stuff, especially in the villages. Um, and these, I have to say to the tribes, especially in the Arctic, these are, 
these are tribes that are on top of the oil and gas land. They get a lot of dividends and funding, of course, in oil where they own the land, right? That that oil and gas is being pumped out of. So they're tribes that have funding. So it's usually funding is not the issue, but personnel is the issue. And I think that gets back to Ellie's comment about, well, nobody even knows what I'm applying for and how Brittany said, make sure it matches because you don't have people and you have weather that's really bad you know, and it blocks logistics. That's your main issue in the Arctic or the logistics and the weather. On that same vein of um, medication and supplies, someone did ask um, about freezing while conducting uh, village health. And if, if that happens, um, is there anything that you did to keep the temperature controlled and things like that? It was a nightmare. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's part of the logistics of functioning up there. So you would have one of the nurses would be in charge of certain medications. We would have temperature control little boxes. We had to carry all that stuff in. And so, for instance, if you're on the bush plane from Barrow out to Koktovik, you can't put that under the plane, you know, in the wings or on the floats or what, you know, whatever it is, however they're flying, it'll freeze, it's gone. You'd have to carry it with you, keep it wrapped up and, and you always had to keep your eyes on that. So yeah, if that was not done, that was ruined. And then the uh, samples, the lab samples, lab specimens, that was usually a nightmare too. There would be times when, you know, mistakes would happen and a lab sample got left out, wasn't put in the right place and it would freeze and be completely ruined. And then you had to get a patient back into a village clinic, but then you had a blizzard hit for four days and nobody's going any. And so you have that, that's Tuesday. That's a normal day up in the Arctic. Yeah, very, very common. Great question. Um, and then we have another question. Are there staffing agencies that supply casual staff? We use a lot of casual staff as community health nurses in the Canadian Arctic. And I'm curious of the similarities. That is as an agency ourselves, interesting. I people, um, yeah. I just want to plug that we do um, uh, send people to Alaska. I'm not sure, obviously remote, but um, we do have um, uh, Alaska uh, assignments for shorter term. Obviously, you can speak to more, Michelle. But <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's very interesting. That's a great uh, question, Anastasia. I'd be very curious, uh, even offline, if you stay in touch with me. What else you you all are doing in? northern Canada, but um, there are many. In fact, I would say certainly when I was there, the bulk of nurses were provided as casual staff nurses. I was very rare. I was actually given a technically a permanent position. I ultimately left because I, I shifted professor jobs, but um, I was given a permanent nursing job. They provided me with great housing, great benefits. My partner, uh, he was up there working remotely and it worked out very well. Um, but typically it is casual staff. That's often how they work there. Lot, many, many, many different companies. Yeah. Although like, obviously I work for Trusted. <laughs> um, there are a ton. If you just Google, um, again, those keywords um, and then short staff, like things like that, short term um, or whatever period you're kind of looking for. Um, there are over... 200, I think, plus agencies out there. Um, so yeah, just to kind of uh, give you a little bit of like oomph, like you, you'll find one, I promise. <laughs> Um, Excellent. honestly, again, we're just seeing your praises. <laughs> Everyone has been loving this Thank information. You. Um, Thank you. I, I'm seeing um, Sherry's background. The they questions. would love you, Sherry. <laughs> yeah, if you have any, those of you that, you know, wanted, you know, combine, uh, you know, the mental health too, if you do behavioral health, great, great need up there. It's very cool. And I have to say there are, you'll get nurses that are up there that are young. You'll get a middle age. I'm, I'm older. I'm, you know, I'm a senior full professor in terms of what I do. I was in my late fifties when I went up there. I thought I'd be the only one. There were a lot of people there my age. It was very cute. They all said, yeah, our kids grew up graduated college and left home, and we went to the Arctic. And there were so many people up there that were having second careers in their late 50s and early 60s, having adventure careers as teachers, mental health counselors, nurses, doctors, whatever. They were having the time of their lives. And, and you will find that the people that do this kind of thing, 
they're this they're all the same tribe member they're adventurous they're people that say yeah hell yeah i'll do that we you know maybe maybe without thinking a bit but you know their their instinct is yeah let's run let's go try it yeah i'll go dog sledding what the heck you know i'll go do that i'll i'll eat i'll try a piece of muck tuck what the heck and they're really fun people i think you'll find a terrific affinity with uh with the folks that go and do this type of remote area medicine and you've got there there's i i've been so pleased with all all the comments and folks and your connections that you made here i think a lot of us can stay in touch with each other and have a lot to share with each other and learn and and that's very much what it's like up in the arctic you're in an extreme remote environment it is literally like being in the moon we would say that at times it was so strange and at times i felt like i was in the bar scene of the first star wars movie you know you got 30 40 50 different languages going and i'm one of them and it's just awesome it's just so so cool so i i think you'd really love it and my contact information uh Oh, very, very interesting. Yeah, Lisa, the mushing. And you know, if you if you want to do mushing, Lisa, I would try to do nursing in the Northwest Borough and Cots. Cotsabue has some of the world's best mushers, including a lot of the women mushers that compete for the Iditarod and a lot of people run dogs. When I was in Barrow, there were only a handful of mushers up there. So we got pretty close, but it's limited. So um, you can still do Arctic nursing, but then do Cotsabue, do the Northwest Borough. And then you can go out every afternoon and go mushing, go help, you know, handle the dogs and then mush. Yeah, it's super fun. And this is my contact information. So again, I'm located, uh, I do a lot of travel, but I'm based out of Carlisle, Pennsylvania by Gettysburg. I'm with the U.S. Army War College, Professor of Environmental Security. Please stay in contact with me. I'd love to know more about you folks and hear your experiences and jay bear and sarah glad to help at any point i know the uh know a lot of the major uh general leifler there and ted stevens center a lot of the, a lot of those folks were very much in touch with them so you're all awesome i hope i see you up there <laughs> hope i see you up there consider the arctic consider antarctica look it up google nursing jobs in antarctica do it do it do it see it now <laughs> oh my goodness, Michelle. I um I can't say uh, thank you enough just for this information. It has just been, oh my goodness, my pleasure. And honestly, my thank favorite you. event of the year, honestly, out of 2022, this has been my favorite, super informative and just super fun awesome. and exciting to just hear about all these stories. So we thank That's you so fun. much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you all of you. Guys you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, um, Brittany, for helping and Kelly for organizing all this. And please stay in touch, all of you. Thank you. And plus, you can just get really cool gear and souvenirs up there. Who would not want to wear this when they go to work? Please, you know. Anyway, thanks, everybody. Up, right? Have a good uh, good end of the year. Good I will holiday. be sending out the slides <laughs> and the recording um, a little bit later um, in the next couple of days. So you'll be getting the slides and the recording, and then you'll also be getting a survey. So just let us know um, how the event was for you, if there's anything else you needed or anything else you're looking for um, in events that we're hosting. Um, and ultimately, we just thank the Wilderness Medical Society so much uh, for uh, partnering with us today um, on this event. And honestly, thank all of you guys. Um, we hope that you have a wonderful and happy holiday. Stay safe and thank you for everything that you guys are doing and have a wonderful night. Yay. Thank Bye you guys. Koyanak Pak. Thank you to Nupia. Koyanak Pak. Stay in touch, everybody. Bye. Thank you.